All right. Good morning. Uh, welcome to the June uh, installment of the Tree Board webinar series. This is the third one for our 2017 series. Today's topic is Growing Your Trees to the USA program. And we have two speakers with us today that will um, hopefully give you guys some ideas on how to build your Trees to the USA program and um, build capacity for your program and, and give you some ideas for Arbor Day celebration and marketing and that kind of stuff. So I'm going to go ahead and introduce both of them and then hand it over to Pete so he can get started. So our first presenter is Pete Smith, and he is the Urban Forestry Program Manager at the Arbor Day Foundation, supporting urban forestry programs including the Tree City, Tree Campus, and Tree Line USA recognition programs. He also works with the annual Partners in Community Forestry Conference and the Energy Saving Trees Program. Prior to joining the foundation in 2014, Pete spent 26 years with the Texas A&M Forest Service. Um, completing his tenure as state coordinator of the Urban Community Forestry Program there. Before leaving Texas, Pete co-authored a new edition of the book, Famous Trees of Texas, published by Texas A&M University Press. In October 2016, Pete completed his fourth Tour to Trees bicycle ride, pedaling 600 miles through North and South Carolina to help raise funds for tree research and education. He is a native of Philadelphia, a naturalized citizen of Texas, and currently lives in Lincoln, Nebraska. Our second presenter is Erica Smith Fishman, and she is with Tree Philly, she is the Tree Philly Program Manager with Philadelphia Parks and Recreation. She coordinates university, urban forestry based community outreach, including tree giveaways with the aim of increasing the tree canopy cover to 30% in all the Philadelphia neighborhoods. She is an ISA certified arborist with a master's degree in environmental horticulture from the University of California, Davis, and has a bachelor's degree in biology from Haverford College. Her favorite tree is the ponderosa pine. So with that, I will go ahead and hand everything over uh, to Pete and, uh, and Erica and get them, oh, that's the wrong presentation, sorry. Um, here we go. So here is Pete, and with that, Pete, I'll go ahead and hand everything over to you. You guys can get started. Well, thank you, Leslie, and uh, it's great to be here on this uh, edition of the uh, the North Carolina uh, Council webinar. Um, excited to talk to you a little bit today about improving your tree board and your community forestry program in your community. And with that. Um, I want to start with a quick reminder about who we are at the Arbor Day Foundation. We are the largest member-based organization dedicated to tree planting in the country, distributing and planting more than 10 million trees each year. And we now have about a million members and supporters, tree lovers all around the country. Membership and the services that we offer to members remain a big part of what we do at the foundation. And part of our aim is to lower the bar for entry into tree planting and tree care. If you were to Google the word trees, uh, either the Arbor Day Foundation or Wikipedia will arrive at the top of the search results. So we are actively engaged in educating millions of people around the country and the globe. And we're based in Lincoln, Nebraska. Now, our mission is to inspire people to plant nurture, and celebrate trees. And our mission has been with us since the Arbor Day Foundation was created on the 100th anniversary of that first Arbor Day event in 1872 in Nebraska City, Nebraska, where citizens are said to have planted more than a million trees that season. And we are chartered to continue the spirit of that first Arbor Day and to bring attention to the importance of planting trees to improve the world. Now, one way we do that is through the Tree City USA program, which has succeeded as a national model for 40 years and counting. We know that Tree City USA is the beginning, not the end, of developing your community forestry program. It gets cities on the path to managing the community forest with the goal of instituting best practices for urban and community forestry. And we know that the program has elevated public awareness of the value of city trees. Pass by one of our signs as you drive into a town and you immediately know that the people there value their city trees. 
We're glad you value the trees in your community, made obvious by your participation on this webinar. So today I want to walk you through a, a revised publication, the Tree Board Handbook. This is something that's been around for a long time, but within the last year or so we have revised this publication. And it's an excellent resource for you and your board. If you don't have a copy, you can get them on our online store, or you can contact your state urban forestry coordinator for a possibility where they might have some copies. And here's our outline for my, my talk today. So let's get started. First, in order to be an effective member of a citizen tree board, you really need to understand your role. Now, you joined the tree board for a reason. Even if someone asked you to serve, it may be because you have expertise in trees, and some boards require positions be allocated to folks that are trained in tree care and know a lot about trees. Or, or you may just be known around town as a tree lover. But no matter what, your, it's your enthusiasm, your passion, and your dedication that's needed on the tree board. Part of your job is to speak for the trees. And know your charge or your charter. Know what the law asks your board to do. What's in your authorizing ordinance? And I know we've had discussions about tree ordinances on this webinar series in the past. So do you govern trees on public property, private property, or both? Do you set policy, or are you simply an advisory group? Do you actually do the, tr the tree work that's needed in your community? Are you allowed to raise and spend money? Or are you focused on advocacy and education? Well, time is a precious commodity for everyone these days, so make your meeting time productive and enjoyable. And the first step is to run effective meetings. So here are some tips. Send reminders out about the upcoming meeting and have a purpose, have an agenda that goes with that reminder. Can't say it often enough, but start and end on time. And then someone will have to manage the discussion that is inevitable, even if it means using Robert's rules of order or the ones I like, which are Bob's rules of order, a little more informal, but still a way to keep the discussion on track. And then someone should summarize, or maybe their official minutes of every meeting, uh, and make sure that everyone knows what's going to happen between your meetings. Now, you're probably not the only one involved in the community tree program, so you must be respectful of city staff, both of their time and their expertise. Your job may be more about asking questions and providing support than directing the work. Remember, these folks already have a boss. And then another important task is to ensure continuity. The quickest way to become ineffective as a tree board is to run out of board members or never have a quorum in order to conduct business. So spend time as a group discussing new community members to ask to become members, especially if that's part of your job. And reach out to other community groups and tap into like-minded community volunteers. Now, Dr. Paul Rees at Oregon State University often talks about the seven habits of highly effective tree boards. And, and here they are. One, Know the board's mission and work accordingly. Two, have a vision but understand limitations and plan accordingly. Three, use your time wisely. Number four, have your eyes on the future, including sustainability of the board itself. Five, seek to make connections throughout the community. Six, Value a process in which ideas are offered 
and developed. And seven, desire to inspire others to work with you. And these are important features of any well-functioning tree board member and tree board. So here are some action items that uh, you should consider as you think about your role on the tree board. First, I think it's useful to re review your tree board ordinance uh, either annually or every time you get a new member on your board. So you may have a tree care ordinance, but in some cities you might also have an ordinance that actually created the tree board. And those two are related, but they may be in separate documents. Either way, review these ordinances and see if any improvements uh, need to be made during the coming year. Write job descriptions for both board members and the chairperson. This is great for uh, handing someone that you're considering for the board uh, a job description of here's what they're getting into, but it's also really useful for the board that is already uh, established just to figure out exactly what is our role here and what are we going to try to accomplish. I think it's a really useful to be a little creative with some of your meetings. Think about bringing in a guest speaker. Maybe it's on a tree topic, but maybe it's just a speaker from another community group or a, another advisory board in your city to try to uh, cross-pollinate, if you will, the, the ideas that are happening at your board and maybe some of the other boards around town. You might also conduct a field tour of an upcoming project or one that's recently completed. You might invite council. I think you could take your meeting on the road to a neighborhood park or a library so that citizens could attend. And then uh, lastly, you're, you're going to want to invite at least one new board member to serve. Now, this might depend on term limits that are established in your ordinance, but spend time during your board meetings to think about how the next year's board is, is going to be uh, established, who the members are, and how it's going to function. Next, as you think about planning the work, sometimes it, it really helps to take a step back and consider what you want to achieve through your community forestry program. So your work often de begins by developing a vision statement to guide your planning efforts. And whatever statement you might develop as your vision will certainly be useful in any sort of a plan that you write. Next, you're probably going to want to review all your existing plans for trees. Plans come in all sorts of shapes and sizes, including things like annual work plans. These are often done by city staff. Uh, emergency management plans. Risk management plans. Maybe you have a canopy cover plan or a five-year management plan. And then there are some other documents like urban forestry master plans and city comprehensive plans. Take a look at all of those uh, periodically. It's also useful to review your existing inventory data. Find out what you have and what you don't have, or how current it is. Things like your city st street tree inventory, or your inventory for parkland and public buildings, or maybe natural areas. What about private property or your city's overall canopy cover? And then ask yourself, how does this data and the analysis that might accompany that data inform the work that gets done? Do you have the tools necessary to keep up? Do you have an effective management system to track the work that gets done? And then use that inventory information, plus your existing plan documents and your known resources like staff and the budget, to identify goals for the next cycle. Maybe it's one year, maybe it's five. And then use the goals that you've set to establish budget targets. Gaps between what is needed and what you should have indicate one role for the tree board. 
make recommendations to council, or seek outside funding where that's allowed. Finally, you want to have plans to evaluate your effectiveness. Are you getting what you want, either annually or over the long term? Do the results of the program continue to match the vision that you wrote? Why or why not? Answers to these questions should guide your next planning cycle. And start tracking some key metrics, such as, for instance, the planting to removals ratio as one way to measure your success. Perhaps from the inventory data, you could identify which species are performing the best in your city, and then start writing species to site matching criteria for new tree planting plans. And consider some of these action items for your board next year. So funding is always in short supply. Consider other sources within the city. Maybe there's a stormwater fee or street frontage fees that could help support the community forestry program. Or even apply for a grant from a third party, like a local foundation. See if the board can help staff with an inventory project, such as conducting an iTree canopy assessment, if one is needed or you don't have any idea about the canopy cover in your city. Could the board assist even with a street tree sample survey? And then use the inventory data that you have to update the city's recommended species list by removing species that might be overplanted and adding new choices, especially new genera. More and more researchers are looking at diversity, not at the species level, but at the genus level, since so many of our insect pests and diseases threaten an entire genus of trees, not just a particular species. So be very cognizant of that and consider guidelines for your city plans that uh, no more than 5 to 10 percent in any one genus are allocated to your tree planting plans. That can help diversify and spread the risk of losses due to the next devastating insect that uh, might appear. Most, uh, you might want to consider looking at your natural areas. Uh, most cities have some kind of a, a, a set of natural areas that aren't maintained with mowers, and, and yet those natural areas may not be included in any of your management plans for urban forests. So considering some way to help your city staff uh, identify and map those areas. And then most importantly, you, you probably, if you don't have one, you should write one. Uh, if you have one, you should probably update this, either every five years or sometimes even sooner when conditions change, your, your city's management plan for city trees. If you've already done those tasks, maybe your city's ready for a canopy cover goal. So consider something like that. Now, as we start to think about uh, how to execute the plans that you've written, first you should understand your role. As a tree board, is your tree board the actual manager of the trees in your city, perhaps overseeing contract work, maybe even city employees in the smallest of towns? Or most likely, are you a volunteer that wants to support city projects? Even though you may have an official city advisory role, when it comes to working on city projects, I'm sure you would have to follow all the rules the city has for volunteers, like waivers for injury, et cetera. And don't overstep your authority by attempting to direct city employees, even when you had a heavy hand in writing the plan. Now, when it comes to the planting or the maintaining or removing trees, you really as a board should understand the city's policies and procedures for accomplishing the work that you've outlined in your annual work plan or your five-year management plan. And where can you support these efforts? Can you help and recruit, uh, help recruit and manage volunteers for certain projects? 
Now, some jobs are dangerous enough that they should be performed only by city staff or contractors. If it's your role to hire those contractors, understand how to hire qualified businesses. Other tasks might be performed by volunteers or other workers with just a little guidance. Is that something you could provide that kind of leadership? And don't forget about those volunteers. Uh, volunteers can stretch city forestry budgets, and city pre tree projects might be the only kind of public works endeavor in which volunteers can actively participate. We, we really don't ask volunteers to fill potholes in our cities and towns, but trees is something that citizens can do, and their time could provide matching value for any grants. Now, most cities and towns have public property that does remain undeveloped, as I mentioned, or in some semblance of a natural state. And many of these so-called natural areas are neglected in that management program. So take stock of what you have and work with local nature groups or educators to develop a plan for what activities should be permitted. Things like mountain, mountain biking or hiking, perhaps horseback riding or snowmobiling. And then how to restore the native vegetation on those sites. I think you could start by going for a hike with your board. And we think of trees as a renewable resource, but they are also recyclable. Give your urban trees a second life by helping city staff use the chips and logs from their activities in projects throughout town. So consider some of these action items for your board and these other volunteers that you might use. So think about a, a training program. If you don't have one already going on with city staff and volunteers, uh, take a look at what the Tree Care Industry Association has in their tailgate safety program. It might be for city workers, and you might help sponsor that activity. But volunteers might also benefit from this sort of education. Now, if no one in the city is a certified arborist, I strongly consider someone on the tree board become one. You might even host a private arborist in your community to review safety procedures for your group. And I'll, finally, I'll mention that the Southern Region Extension Forestry website does host a series of educational modules for urban forestry training that's extremely valuable both for tree boards, city staff, and maybe even some volunteers. Now, planting trees is good. I might even say that it's great, and it's, it's certainly our motto at the Arbor Day Foundation. But having them survive is even better. And while staff time might be best spent on the most urgent work, Tree board members can easily monitor survival for newly planted trees and even perform some simple maintenance while they're there. And speaking of uh, volunteers and long-term success, you might consider developing, with city staff's help, a, a program to visit and annually maintain the youngest trees in your city. This is the best investment that a city can make to reduce long-term pruning costs. I always encourage folks to um, visit construction projects that are on public property. Your, your city probably has a list. Maybe it's uh, inspectors that are doing this kind of work. And report to the city officials any violations uh, if you have such a clause in your public tree care ordinance. But since your job is to speak for the trees, sometimes it's good to point out things that might be going wrong on public property around your public trees. I think you can work with city staff to install some recycled wood products, even just mulch, on a prominent city project. And better still, create some wood benches or some other substantial items to install that are using some of the products of the work that city staff does. And then consider a volunteer program to restore a natural area in some way, such as removing invasive species or planting native species. These are all activities that can be really valuable uh, to expand your program and expand your influence in your city. So now, when we're talking about the communication aspects of a tree board, 
even when your role in carrying out the tree work is small, you can have a big influence on how citizens view trees and view your tree program. Programs to teach citizens about trees, whether it's on public property or in their own backyards, can strengthen support for municipal tree work. When people value something, they tend to invest in it. Now you should consider your role as communicators. Sometimes you're going to want to tailor any of your key messages to different segments within your community, whether it be citizens, whether it be private arborists and nurseries, of course your city leaders like staff and city council, and maybe just your volunteers. Each of these groups can and should be reached using different methods and styles of communication. And in this day and age, you should probably find a way to participate in social media to, sp to spread the word of your activities, your volunteer opportunities, your meetings, your events, and your success stories. Traditional media, like your local paper, your radio, TV, is still an important way to find out what's going on in the community. So learn how to create allies among local journalists and seek out these opportunities. But maybe your biggest role as a member of the tree board, as I said, is to speak for the trees. You must advocate for the trees in your community. So seize any chance to spread your key message that community trees deliver lots of benefits. iTree proves this. But they require an investment, an investment in care and an investment in replacement to maintain and grow those benefits over time. But of course, don't forget your uh, official reason, perhaps, for a citizen tree board, and that is to report to city council periodically. Don't neglect this role and seek it out annually. Deliver a concise report and use your Tree City USA status as a primary reason to address council. And here are some action items. Even though you might have a good set of rules that govern the planting and the care of city trees, most citizens won't know about it unless you tell them. What can they do? What must they do? And what may they not do to city trees? How will municipal tree care activities affect them? A public tree care guide is a good place to start. Next, you might have an education program that uh, to consider. It might be as simple as leading tree walks in different neighborhoods to point out tree species or heritage trees. Or there, you might craft more formal classes on tree care using city staff and other organizations in your town. Think about a, a new awards program to recognize outstanding community members that support city trees or partner with a community organization to add a community forestry award to their program. As I said, deliver an annual report to council on the program with staff at your side and reflect on the goals for the year and how they were met. When you complete more detailed inventory or assessment projects, consider a state of the urban forest report that details the extent, the quality, and the benefits that are provided by the urban forest. And perhaps you want to become a member of the Alliance for Community Trees. It's the national network for nonprofit groups, urban forestry councils, and municipal tree groups across the country housed here at the Arbor Day Foundation as one of our programs. And one of those important parts of communicating the benefits of trees and community forestry is to host and publicize community celebrations of trees like Arbor Day. In the second part of this webinar, in just a minute, I'm going to turn it over to Erica to highlight some of the methods that Tree Philly uses to keep Arbor Day and tree planting season fresh, always trying to reach for new audiences. And after all the work you've done during the year to improve your program by taking it to the next level, don't forget to apply for a growth award as part of your recertification application 
in Tree City, USA. Growth awards, and, and most of the checklist items that I've listed here would qualify for a growth award, can be one really useful way to improve your communication to city leaders and the public. So thanks for considering the variety of ways that I've offered to improve your community forestry program and your tree board. As I mentioned, uh, I do have my notes on the webinar page that you can download to refresh your memory on some of these tips. And of course, you can also get a copy of this tree board handbook, which was the model for my presentation today. And now I'm going to turn it over to Erica to share some of the great ideas for celebrating Arbor Day to round out our webinar today. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Pete. Um, this is Erica, and I'm just bringing up my presentation. All right. Here it is. Um, I just want to thank um, Pete and Leslie for having me today. Um, I'm going to be talking about Arbor Day and some of the creative and uh, very different ideas that we've uh, used to celebrate Arbor Day and get people talking about trees in Philadelphia. Um, as Pete said, uh, celebrating Arbor Day is one of the uh, requirements for the Tree City USA application, so I hope that I can give you some good ideas today. Um, this is also part of a presentation that I'll be giving along with the nonprofit Trees Atlanta at the Partners in Community Forestry Conference and AC Trees Day um, in Tulsa in November, uh, which is a conference that Pete um, organizes and is a fantastic conference. So this is just a pitch that if you'd like to learn more about some of these things and hear more ideas, then you should come and, and listen to us. <laughs> so just a little bit of background first. Um, Tree Philly, uh, it is a program of the Philadelphia Parks and Recreation Department. It is a community outreach program. Um, this is the program that I manage, and I am a city employee. It's a city program, but it does operate in many ways a little bit more like a nonprofit. I'm going to go into that in a little bit. Um, we do have nonprofit partner and a sponsor for a lot of the work that we do. Um, and some background about Philadelphia itself and the Parks and Recreation Department. Uh, this is a map of the city of Philadelphia with our seven watershed parks you can see on the map. Um, parkland was originally preserved on either side of the Schuylkill River, which is, I'm going to use my handy little laser pointer to show everyone. This is the Schuylkill River here, and the east and west Fairmount Park here were originally preserved in the 1790s as a way to provide safe drinking water during the yellow fever epidemics um, in the city. And then the city began to purchase uh, private land from people starting in the 1840s to um, expand the park. And uh, today, the Philadelphia Parks and Recreation Department uh, contains uh, – manages 10,500 acres, which is 13% of the city property. Um, we have 130 parks and 151 recreation centers and playgrounds around the city that we manage. Um, and we have three crews of 10 arborists each for uh, park property. They, they plant, prune, and remove trees on all of those acres. Uh, we also have 135,000 street trees that we manage. Um, and about eight street tree contract management staff. And then we have the community engagement program, Tree Philly, and there are about three of us who uh, advocate for trees, uh, educate people, and try to encourage people to plant trees on their private property. Um, in Philadelphia, we have an average of 20% tree canopy. You can see in this map on the right, um, it's not equitably distributed in the city, um, and we have a tree canopy goal of 30% canopy in each neighborhood of the city. So this is an effort to um, equitably distribute tree canopy in each neighborhood so that everyone can benefit from um, the increased shade, stormwater capture, beauty, and, um, you know, other benefits of trees. One of the ways 
that we are um, attempting to reach that goal is to encourage people to plant trees on their private property through a yard tree giveaway program. And this is um, the main program that the Tree Philly Community Engagement Program um, runs. Uh, we give away free trees for people to plant on their private property. Uh, we do it every spring and fall. We started in the spring of 2012. Uh, we have a pre-registration period that um, people uh, have to pre-register for the trees. And this is important to uh, not only spread the word about the tree giveaways themselves, but also as a period of time when we are talking about trees uh, and the department is talking about trees and the whole city is talking about trees. It's an opportunity to get people um, thinking and talking about trees and not just the tree giveaway program. Um, and we have about 12 to 15 different species of trees that we give away to people from large shade trees to small flowering trees and fruit trees as well. Um, at the tree giveaways, everyone has to go through a tree planting and care demonstration, and we give everyone free mulch, um, a bag of mulch with each tree, because we want these trees to get uh, the best start that they can. Um, we focus our events in neighborhoods that have low existing canopy but high possible canopy. Um, we know that there are yards that people can plant trees in. There is space um, for people to be planting these trees. Um, and since 2012, we have given away 19,000 free trees. Um, so we plan on continuing that success in the future. Um, we couldn't do this program, though, without our partners. And the main uh, partner we have is a corporate sponsor, TD Bank, um, and they uh, sponsor the Yard Tree Giveaways because we are not, um, we're not able to use city money to give away trees uh, for people's private property improvement. Um, we also have a nonprofit partner, which is our, our Fairmount Park Conservancy. Um, and we are lucky enough to also have a marketing partner, a Masterminds Agency, which works with us pro bono. So these, this is the team that makes the Tree Philly Yard Tree Giveaway program possible. Um, so that's just a little bit of background. Today I wanted to talk to you mostly about Arbor Day. Um, so as Pete said, part of your job as a tree board is to advocate for trees, get people talking and thinking about them, and Arbor Day is the perfect time to do this because everyone in the country has heard of Arbor Day, and it is something people expect to, to see, and they want to be able to celebrate trees. Um, so starting with the basics, um, first of all, uh, Philadelphia has been a Tree City USA for 41 years now uh, since the program began in 1976, so we're very proud of that. This is a picture that you're seeing um, from our celebration last year. Um, I'm going to start with the basics. Every Arbor Day celebration that we do includes um, an opportunity for local dignitaries, city council, the mayor, the managing director to come um, and speak to people uh, at a press event to express their support of urban forestry. If, if this is not part of your um, program already, then you should definitely be adding it. This is a great opportunity to get people who are already advocates um, to be, to give them a platform to speak. But also, you know, city council members love to talk at press events, and if you invite them, they will often come. So it's an opportunity for you to engage your local politicians. Um, in this photo here, we also have a familiar face. I'm going to use my little laser pointer tool again. This is Pete right here. I'm outing you, Pete. <laughs> so Pete got a chance to come to our 40th celebration of our Tree City USA at our Arbor Day um, last year. Um, another a couple things about the basics of your Arbor Day celebration, you should uh, make sure you have a press release that goes out um, and make sure you have a speaking program again so that local dign dignitaries can have a platform to speak. Uh, another uh, a couple things about basic Arbor Day events, uh, tree planting is kind of a no-brainer. I don't even really have to say it. Tree planting at Arbor Day events, great opportunity to use momentum um, 
in support of trees to get a couple trees in the ground. And engaging children, also a really important thing to include, um, not only for the benefit of the children themselves and their education, but also because um, having kids in a, at an event is a good draw for, for local press. And you're going to hear me talk about press a couple times. Um, you know, in your role as advocates and communicators for the urban forest, uh, engaging the press is really important. And so any opportunity that you can have to um, give them a good visual or a good story to promote urban forestry is, is some, an opportunity that you should be taking. So these are some basic Arbor Day um, ideas, but other Arbor Day ideas, um, we have a couple of things that we've done I'm going to tell you about um, to try to kind of mix it up a little bit and not just be planting trees every season, though we do always make sure we plant at least one tree. But we like to sometimes focus on tree maintenance. This is something that is hard to get people to talk about, and it's very expensive to do. Um, often uh, large trees are expensive to maintain, but uh, if you have a platform like Arbor Day, you can sometimes use it to talk about tree care and not just tree planting. This is a picture here of an Arbor Day celebration for, from a few years ago, uh, which has our former mayor, um, our commissioner at the time, and the, our partners from the Conservancy and our sponsor. And so it's a great opportunity to get people talking about tree maintenance as well. Um, a good opportunity to do arboriculture demonstrations to talk about the field of arboriculture and promote it as well. Um, I'm going to talk about our Brew Day, which is a partnership we have with a local brewing company. Um, I'm going to talk about a student art show that we did uh, displaying tree-themed art and a tree-themed art scavenger hunt. So let's get right into it. Tree maintenance. Um, so we were talking a little bit uh, before this, and Pete mentioned that in North Carolina is often too hot in April during Arbor Day to, to plant trees anyway, so why not focus your Arbor Day event on tree maintenance instead? Um, the importance of pruning trees and, and of uh, pruning young trees specifically and of mulching, uh, these are all things that you can do, you can talk about them, and then you can have a volunteer work day to, to do them. This is a picture of uh, TD Bank uh, volunteers from our Arbor Day celebration last year, pruning, uh, doing light pruning, and then mulching some of the um, trees in, in our um, arboretum at the Horticulture Center here in Philadelphia. Um, and and young tree maintenance is something that volunteers can do at an Arbor Day celebration with a small amount of education and training from, from volunteer leaders. So that's a, a great way to get people engaged. Um, again, here's a picture of um, some volunteers maintaining a tree at our, our Arbor Day celebration. Um, beyond using volunteers, we, in the past two years, have engaged the local chapter of our International Society of Arboriculture, and they have, um, ha they have used our Arbor Day celebration as an official volunteer workday for their professional members. And we have had professional arborists from the region come and volunteer time to prune and maintain some of the larger trees in our park system. Here you can see um, taking down dead limbs from uh, a large oak tree in the park. Um, and they have brought uh, their bucket trucks, their chipper trucks, their, you know, all sorts of equipment. They've uh, donated thousands of dollars worth of their staff time and um, equipment to helping us on Arbor Day. Um, and they are all looking for something like that to do on Arbor Day. So that's a really great partnership that you can look into. Um, also, again, a really good draw for press because everyone loves watching someone climb a tree and use a chainsaw. So this is uh, a unique visual that they don't get very often, and you can make sure to include that in any press release that you send out saying, you know, please come you'll have some really interesting footage for the nightly news. <laughs> Our boriculture demonstrations are um, another thing that we've focused on this past year especially. Um, 
Arbor Day is a great platform to be talking to the next generation about the field of arboriculture um, and educating them. These are some school children talking to our city, our, one of our city um, arborists, Dave Cups, here on the right. Um, he demonstrated how to use the equipment that we use. Uh, you can see the safety equipment, the pole saws, the, the um, saddles and um, ropes are all out there. For, for the kids to see, um, he taught them how to tie notes and how, uh, you know, all that works. And as a special perk, we got the kids saddled up and up in trees. So, again, it's just a really fun way of getting people talking about trees in a different way. Um, the kids loved it. And you can see we really got them up into the trees. Um, again, really good for press and uh, visuals for them. Um, so this is, you know, a really fun way of doing something a little bit different for Arbor Day. All right. Now for something very different. Um, our Brew Day is a partnership that we have with a local brewing company here in Philadelphia. We've been doing it for about four years now, and we bring trees to bars on Arbor Day during happy hour. Um, and we give them away to people. And we have uh, people at, uh, we had about between five and ten bars participate in this. And we'll bring the trees to the bars. We'll promote it beforehand. Um, you can see the poster says, trees for your yard, uh, because they're, it's a yard tree giveaway. And then yards for your mouth, yards being the brewing company. So just clever little ways to get people's attention. Um, and then the hashtag our brew day there on the left, you can see we, we try to get people talking about this on social media as well. And this has been a really interesting way for us to get a totally different um, kind of audience of people, community of people talking about um, talking, talking about trees on Arbor Day. And if you have your Arbor Day celebration in the morning, you can still have time to go to the bars during happy hour and give away a few trees. Um, at our celebrations, we give people a T-shirt that says drink beers, plant trees with every tree. And we've created these little um, funny signs with the hashtag Arbor Day on the bottom so that they can take pictures. These pictures are from um, the social media accounts of these people who came to pick up trees. And they share it. And then the message is uh, exponential on social media with all of their friends seeing it. And so you're getting people to talk about trees in a totally different way than, than you would be otherwise. All right, the Student Art Show, um, we did this this year for Arbor Day. Um, we partnered with a local school uh, for a tree-themed art show. This picture is from the press conference that we had in a local park where we displayed the art. Uh, this is our commissioner talking to the kids um, along with her daughter there. Um, we presented to the school earlier at a special assembly that was called the Hug a Tree Assembly where we had our director of uh, urban forestry talk to them about the importance of trees and how uh, trees need to be cared for. And then the art teacher followed up by um, having art lessons over the course of the following month or two um, and having them uh, make this art. And then they chose about 40 pieces that we then displayed at a local park. So I'm going to highlight a couple of my favorite pieces just for fun. Um, these are some of my my favorites. It did uh, rain on the day, so you can see, um, but it didn't it didn't uh, diminish our enthusiasm. Of course, this combined getting local politicians to speak at a speaking program, having kids there, and we planted a tree. So it hits a lot of the things I've already talked about. Um, so you can see they pr um, produced some really beautiful art, and some of it was a bit intense. <laughs> you can see this one. Uh, the tree on the left says, I am cared for, and the tree on the right says, I was betrayed. So some of them took the message very, very much to heart. You can even see, I'm going to use my laser pointer again, the tree on the right has a mulch volcano here, which was a big takeaway that the kids got from the assembly. Um, so you, you can see that they really, they really got the message. And again, here's a picture from the, the event where we um, displayed the art. And um, part of the reason for doing this 
specific um, event at this park was that we were having some issues with the small, the young trees that were newly planted um, being kind of beat up by the local kids. And so this is an attempt to educate them about the importance of trees and then have a fun Arbor Day event where they have a, you know, they have their art displayed and they take some ownership over the trees in the park. All right, the last, um, the last uh, event I'm going to talk about, I just noticed that we're close to our time, but I'm going to talk about the scavenger hunt that we did. This was a social media-based scavenger hunt, and I directly stole this idea from Trees Atlanta, um, and they did it really, really well, and I, I tried to copy them, and it was really fun. Um, we partnered with artists who made art inspired by trees, and the artists left the, the art around the city for people to find, and then they posted on social media when they found it. And we did this leading up to Arbor Day as a way of um, getting people excited for Arbor Day coming up. So here are just a few pictures of the posts from the artists and the posts from people who found the art um, and some ideas of what, what that art looked like. Um, and again, posting on social media about Arbor Day as a way to get people really enthusiastic um, leading up to it, but also as a way of kind of uh, exponentially increasing the effect that your, uh, that your message has because everyone who posts about it, then their friends see it, et cetera. And so this was a really cool glow-in-the-dark diorama. This is a weaving that was left in a, a subway station that's, that's uh, loosely based on a tree. Um, and then again, people posted uh, when they found the art as well. So in conclusion, I'm happy to answer any questions, and I hope I've given you some interesting ideas. All right, excellent. Thank you, Erica and Pete. Um, so we do have a few minutes where we can take some questions. Again, just type the question in um, to the Q&A tab in the top left of your computer. You can type the question in, and I'll get um, the speakers to to answer them um, in a timely manner. Um, so while you guys are maybe writing out a question or two, I wanted to um, thank everybody for participating. And then I did say we got ISA credits. And this is the, the code that you'll need to, re to report. It's self-reporting, so you just need to copy down that code at the bottom or in the middle of the screen here and then submit that to ISA to get your one hour of Arbor credits, Arbor's credits. Um, and then uh, we do have one more webinar in our 2017 webinar series coming up in August. Um, so hopefully, you know, to beat the heat, if it's super hot in August, you can stay, in, stay inside it and, and catch the last webinar of our webinar series talking about advocating and marketing your message, which does tie directly into what Erica and Pete talked about today, about getting the word out there and engaging the public and, and engaging the press. So Rachel's going to talk about um, you know, how to advocate and market effectively, what language to use and that kind of stuff. So that's a good one to, to maybe also reach. But I'm going to turn it back to um, this here so everybody has it. Um, I don't see any questions coming through, so maybe I'll just give everybody another minute or two if there is a question. Um, but both Pete and, and Erica, you guys did a great job giving people some ideas and, and thoughts on how they can maybe expand their efforts or do them a little bit better, um, or a little bit ex more effectively, I guess. Um, so, we, um, but I I've, I've really appreciate it. your time with it. I don't know. You don't have any questions coming through. This is, Thanks, I mean, you guys do your job really, really well. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like there might be one under Q&A. Um, it, it's not a question. It's a uh you guys did an awesome job. <laughs> they call it. So that's great. But I think that they appreciate some of the information that you guys were able to relay. Um, and I guess one other thing for the attendees, um, if you have questions for either Erica or Pete and you need to get in touch with them, and if you miss their um, contact information, you can always just email me and I'll, I'll relay it uh, to either one of them um, if you want to follow up with them on any of the ideas or suggestions that they made. But if no one has any questions, um, then we can go ahead and end the session and, and take some of this knowledge back to our tree boards and get some of the stuff in action.
Well, thanks, Leslie, and thanks, Erica. I appreciate it, and thanks for the opportunity. Yes, I agree. Thank you, Leslie. Thanks, Pete. Oh, here we oh, go. I got one. to get one question. I got one question. It says, how do I keep my tree board's work from being hijacked by allied groups such as, pol as the pollinator group? Um, that's a good question. I, you know, I, I feel like that there's a whole new movement in cities around pollinator habitat, this idea of native habitats and pollinators in particular, nature, gardening, those sorts of things, and, and then the more expansive food forest idea, permaculture. I, I really think community forestry groups need to be the ones reaching out uh, to these other groups and trying to figure out how can trees be part of their solution? How can we look at our tree lists in our cities that might be, how do we improve native, our, our list of native trees? How do we get nurseries to stock that material? Sometimes the pollinator groups have really good connections uh, with all sorts of horticultural plants. They have some some nursery friends that they're really trying to engage with. And I think the native native trees, native trees are important for our cities and they ought to be part of our tree planting plans, maybe not exclusively, but I know that there are ways to incorporate uh, some of the ideas that they've got within that movement into the community forestry program. Um, and I would say um, it might be good to create a subcommittee for pollinator stuff because that way you can make sure that the people who are interested in that have a voice, but it's not taking over everything, you know, the, the whole conversation. So I think the pollinator subcommittee. We work with um, the, the uh, Philadelphia Bee Guild, and they produce a list called uh, Bees and Trees where they highlight all the trees that are good bee fodder. And so I can share that with you if you'd like to use that as well. Um, but I think a subcommittee might be a good way of doing that. I will put in a plug for the Partners Conference that we are looking to do one of our tour options will actually be sort of an indoor tour and a whole design charrette by some experts in the permaculture movement talking about how to engage in, in that, that, that new group of volunteers and activists within cities around nature gardening. How do we bring nature home? How do we encourage it and, and incorporate it into some of the things that we want to accomplish through community forestry? Excellent. That's a good, a good one to follow up with. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, I didn't see any other questions come in. There is um, just so about the ISA credit. Okay. Um, yeah, so it should be up on the screen now. Um, it's that the code that you need is right there underneath the Growing Your Tree to the USA program. It's the PP-17-123. So that's the ISA code that you need, and you'll be able to submit that to ISA, um, and then uh, you'll get the one-hour credit. And the conference in Tulsa that Pete is referring to is the Partners in Community Forestry Conference. It's their annual conference in this um uh, it's in November of, of each year. So this year it's in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And I think um, Mark's question is how do I obtain it? So you just go to the ISA website, and then it, there's an option to to um, self-report on, on a for credit, right? right? Yeah. Yeah. There, it's, there's a little form that you can print out um, and, and mail in to ISA. Sorry about that. But, yeah. This is self-reporting for me to look up on the ISA's website. All right. Um, okay. Well, if there's no more questions, so we'll go ahead and, and end the, the webinar. But thanks again for everybody for attending. Thank you so much, Erica and Pete, for providing the information that some of these guys can hopefully take back to their communities and, and get put into action. Um, and with that, I guess we will end it, and hopefully we will see you guys again uh, for the August webinar. Yeah, it looks like Anne is asking for more information about the Tulsa conference. Okay. Well, and you can just email me, and I can forward you to their um, website and that kind of stuff. So I'll follow yeah. up with you, Anne. It'll be November 15th and 16th, Tulsa, Oklahoma. The hotel information is already up there, and our registration site will go live July 5th. Okay. All right. Thank you again.
Yep, Bye thanks. Now. Have a good day, everyone. Bye-bye.